Welcome to the Rich and Success Podcast, the podcast that aims to define exactly what success is to you and helps you implement this into your daily life. Hosted by cousins, actor, singer, and multiple business owner Matt Hall, and ex rugby player, health, well being, and fitness coach Dan Ramsden. Join them on this exciting journey as they unravel the minds of their inspirational guests in a quest of self discovery. Are you ready to take your life to the next level? If so, this is the podcast for you. Now let today's lesson begin. Welcome back to this episode of Rich in Success. We are super, super excited to be joined by Mr. Robbie Hunter-Paul. And Robbie, I've just got to say, before we start, when I left the office today, uh, a lovely lady, shout out to Dawn, who works in our office. She said to me... Hey, Dawn. She said, hey, Dawn. Uh, there you go, you got the moment. She said, I know Robbie for two reasons. She said, number one, he played for Bradford Bulls. I didn't do it, I promise you. <laughs> you can't prove a thing, it wasn't me, I didn't do Is it. Is that all? Oh, okay. Yeah, you, we've got that out there, Dawn. No, she said, number one, played for Bradford Bulls. Yeah. And number two, she used to work in a care home. And, all right. and one of her residents there had a calendar. And you happen to be on one of the months. Okay. And what she remembers is that month managed to last 12 months. It never changed. <laughs> you were on that wall all year round. So there you go. Shout out to Dawn's resident. I didn't get a name. To be honest, that may have been... I did a calendar for my testimonial year. Yes. And uh, every, every picture was me. So it might have been that calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did... Um, what did we do? It was pretty cool, actually, that calendar for my testimonial year. It was... Um, 12 months in 10 years, that's what it was called. All right, and okay. what we did is we went around all the landmarks in Bradford and we did photographs of every landmark in Bradford. So we're up at, um, so like we went to um, the, 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 corn, uh, the Wool Exchange. Um, that was one of the venues, uh, uh, Bradford Grammar, obviously Odsal, um, the Alumbra, um, the Cinematography Museum outside of the front of the, um, uh, uh, the town hall itself. Beautiful old buildings, you know, Bradford is just, got such a history to it, such a rich history, and yeah. there were just so many locations that we just thought, we need to be a part of this. Um, down at Salts Mill, also, yeah, yeah, you know, down there. Yeah. There's just so many landmarks, it just has such rich history, you know. Uh, it was the wealthiest place on the planet at one point. Yeah, yeah. What was Bradford with all the mills and the textile industries built around it, so. Um, it's great that that history's still there, like say, Salts Mill. Artistry. Yeah. Yeah, I, before, a lot of people probably don't know that I used to be a, I used to be at art school before I became a professional rugby player and that's always played an important part in my life and um, to see that type of beauty and you don't get that in New Zealand. New Zealand's a really young country so you don't get you know a lot of concrete and glass sure. and steel yeah. in New Zealand not not proper structured beautifully uh, uh, architectured buildings you know yeah, like yeah. you get here in the in the in the older cities was that and one of Brad the things that attracted you to stay uh, you know what you, what attracted me to stay with people the people made me welcome yeah, and the, the weird the wickedest thing about it the people made me welcome from day one i went to when i arrived here from New Zealand, I was like a fish out of water and to paint the picture properly, and this may be a little bit too old for use to, but I knew nothing about England and less about the city in the north of England called Bradford. Um, but the, the week before I left to come to England, there was a movie that came on, um, on TV and it was called Rita, Sue and Bob 2. Oh, now you wow. know that. Because you're <laughs> a Bradford. Know that you know yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, okay. it, everybody knows it in Bradford. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, for, for those of you that don't, that are watching or listening at home, it's a black, cult, uh, black comedy, cult, cult comedy. Yep. Um, set in a council estate in Bradford, um, a Buttershaw estate. Yeah. Uh, basically about a babysitting shagging dad yeah, from exactly that council that, estate. Yeah. And, you know, it's sort of like the original so Shameless, wasn't it? So funny. Exactly. You know, that, yeah. it, it actually encapsulated a, an impression of the culture at that time. And there was a lot of the stereotypes that were really amplified. But that was, before I got to Bradford, and that, that was... the only education. Oh, out. man, I got, off, I got off the plane with a piece of mum's skirt still out tightly. Man, I don't <laughs> want to go. Henry, <laughs> my brother Henry was coming to Wigan, who'd already been over here. He had yeah. sold me this dream about all these amazing beaches in the north of England and palm trees as far as I could see, <laughs> golden sands. 
He lied wow. to me, man. He, he did. Who needs, who needs, who needs <laughs> enemies with brothers like that? Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I never thought we'd get straight onto Rita Sue and Bob too. No, that's, that's I love brilliant. That. I love that. That was your only idea of Bradford. That was it. Well, and was you know, it, was but, it any but, different? But, but, but you know, it was very different. Exactly. So the first day I got here, I, I get them. It's so good to go back and watch that movie now because you get it. When 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 you're down under and the culture is very different, it's like that's terrible. But you actually can can appreciate the humor once you integrate into the culture. But like I said, look, the reason why I stayed was because of the, the, the people. You know, the first day I remember going to, I was sponsored by a pub called the Fire Brigade. And um, for Fire Brigade pub just off Thornton Road. And um, the first day I went there, man, just everyone. I, I had a young child with me, Aisha. She was only one years of age. She had literally just learned to walk that day, the day we arrived. Wow. So her first steps were taken in England. And um, the, the people were just so welcoming, absolutely just welcomed us with open arms, uh, kind of put you on your shoulder. And then from that point onwards, for the, for the rest of the, what, 26 years I've been here, it's just, it's never stopped. You were quite young, weren't you, when you came? I was 18. 18. I was 18. There's a room that goes around, I was 16. I look 16, <laughs> but I was 18. Um, my mum wouldn't let me, <laughs> let me leave New Zealand. Um, well, I, mean, I what, grew up in my grandfather's point? sort of um, study, and uh, my grandfather just basically, it was just an art room. So there was canvases, and it just piqued my interest and started my creative juices. He taught. Uh, through trial and error, he, he was a he was a he was a stubborn old thing, but you know he found that we had some talent. Oh, I had some talent in that. Then he'd start working with me on perspective and stuff like that. And then you just follow your passions. So was that um, kind of the first thing then before sport even became a thought? Yeah, I was going to be. I was going no, no. Sport was always my passion. Okay. Yeah. I, I started playing rugby when I was four. Yeah. Uh, played representative rugby from as early as you can from mm. under nines. Yeah. So I was playing. It's just in your blood. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's in every Kiwi's blood. We yeah. play rugby. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I get people saying, "Well, wouldn't you have rather have played football?" And I'm like, "You gotta understand New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand just they, they just don't. They don't. Ex especially during the '80s when I was growing up. You just there was one sport. Well, there were two sports, both codes of rugby. My suburb in Auckland played rugby league. And that's why, where do you, you play the sport where you can bike to training on. Mm. And that's why I played rugby league. It was also the only code that was professional at that time. So when it came time, I played rugby union for school and I played a bit of representative rugby union for school, but rugby league, you just do, you do more. The balls and play a lot more. So I've always been, been more passionate about rugby league. Although I played both, both codes professionally and both codes amateur, at amateur level, even after retiring. So when I retired from my professional career, I played a, a season at Amateur Rugby League and I played um, a couple of seasons at Amateur Rugby Union. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just keeping ticking yeah. over, you know. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. You get used to getting bashed and bashing people. You do, so. don't you? <laughs> so I miss it. It was always my passion. Um, art was something else that I was always very passionate about. I love to read. I, I consume things. I love to learn. Uh, and I'm always curious about how... I look at things quite uh, sort of from left field. I like to pull things apart and understand things. I'm a, I'm an irrational thinker. I need to have an understanding of why things. So I like a lot of science applied to things and evidence, um, evidence-based decision making. That's. But equally, I'll go with my gut. Uh, yeah. You know. But I, I, people call it intuition, and I think that intuition is actually connected to the, to the subconscious. Mm. I have to give it a rationale. So mm. that's where my brain works. I have yeah, to give it a, yeah. And I think that subconscious is pulled in, you know, because we absorb so much information all the time. My, my understanding of it, that gut feeling, is actually based on um, knowledge that is stored in your subconscious. Even though you can't, and you don't, can't quite pinpoint why you think this is the right thing to do, it's because your subconscious has pulled in that information at some point and it's telling you, although not giving you the detailed information. So that's how I think about it. Geez, you don't want to live in my head. Um, <laughs> I do. It sounds like we're going to get crazy. deep. Was, gonna was, get was art always the, the, like the catalyst to de-stress then in between, you know, such a macho sport, 
you know, you, you, you regard it as, you know, you've got to be tough and you've got to be a bit, bit rough and violent, I guess, when you're playing rugby. You know, that's, that's the thing that they instil in you, you know, to, to get up when you're, when you're hurt and things like that. I remember when I started to go through the levels and I was screamed at from the sideline to get up when I, when I got a, a head injury and the, I was, they were screaming at me to get onside. And Just get that, back that in the line. you get back in line, so you do. And you get used to that toughness, mm. but sometimes, you know, that, that can go as a detriment to you as a person, you know, because we all have a little bit of weakness sometimes, don't we? And um, what, was that a good catalyst for you to, to step away from you know the what? sport? I, uh, art for me is such a frustrating medium to, 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 to be passionate about. Uh, so people say, well, that, is that your release? And I say, well, actually, art makes me more frustrated than anything else. <laughs> because when things aren't going well, when me, the, I'm either just, I'm just not being able to mix the, cam uh, the colours right or, the, you know, I'm not understanding quite how to use certain, certain different art mediums that I'm working with and I'm new to it and it doesn't, it's not coming to the fruition. You know, when I get a finished piece of artwork, I cannot see the artwork, I can see the flaws, all the flaws in it. People... Art is an eye of the beholder, mm -hmm. but I, I, I see the flaws, the, the, the problems, the things that weren't quite going right. And, and um, I've, I've, never, I've never ever done a perfect piece. I've never. So, but it was. It had to be. Because, you, like you explained, you've got this thing that you just, it's so hyper masculine, it's so violent, it's so immersing, and you're doing it. And, and the reason why you're doing the, 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 the rugby is you, you're training into your muscles, muscle memory, so you just do it naturally without thinking about it. So I'm hurt, I'm injured, but I've got to get back in the line, but I'm not. So you get to that point where you're not having to be yelled at to do it, you just do you it. You just do it. You just yeah. do it. You know, yeah. you can't, yeah. you know, you got your head knocked off, you're, everything's flying, yeah. but you know in the back of your mind you've got to be in that line of defence. Yeah. Now what art was was something that allowed me to look at, I guess, to a certain extent, be present. Come, okay. Stop thinking about the game. Stop. It's been complete. Although it wasn't a calming thing for me, it was a, re, a complete release from that other very physical side of my being and the very stressful side and, you know, the expectation side. Yeah. And no good one balanced, expected me to be a good artist. And I'm not. I'm just someone who, who loves doing it. Um, I didn't. You know, to, to, it's like anything. To be a good artist, I would need to have spent the 10,000 hours that I had invested into being a good rugby player. Yeah. Something's got to give. We only have so much, much time in the day that you've got to, you, you can't be the greatest at everything. To be great, you've got to invest the time, energy, and emotional capacity into that. But equally, to be able to review what it is that you're doing, you have to be able to step away from it and actually be able to self-audit. And for me, uh, definitely was a release. The music to it, weren't they as well? Oh, let's not go into that. Should we not? <laughs> Look, uh, the, the music, I love music, yeah, like everyone else does. The Māori people are musical people. Uh, we didn't have a written language uh, per, per se. So, to pass on story and lessons and how to get from how to survive, it was passed down through um, tamoko, so through tattoo, that, that, that told, told, tells a story. It was passed down through um, storytelling, you know, um, uh, semi-fictional stories of, of gods and that, to, to teach lessons, which has happens in absolutely every culture, also told through, those stories are told through song and dance and actions. And so I grew up, as I grew up, I was quite heavily influenced by my, uh, my, my Māori side of my family. Um, I was a part of the, what we call a kapahaka groups for all of my schools, and you learn how to sing. I've got a terrible voice. I cannot sing. So then rap come along in the 80s, you know, and, and rap yeah. really blew up. So yeah. there was now a, a musical outlet that I could actually 
not sound yeah. as terrible you as... You could talk yeah. instead yeah. of sing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, well, geez, you tell that to a rapper and you're going to get a slap. But, All right. Well, I did that. Ash, edit that bit out. Yeah, just edit <laughs> Any rappers, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I'm sticking up for the rap, rap, yeah, rapper community. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, um, uh, so that's where the music come from. And there was a design... And we, we were lucky enough to have some good people around us in our lives that were actual musicians. So um, the music that, that you're talking about is when we formed that band, Massey. Now, how that came about was they were a main sponsor for the Bradford Bulls. One of their, so they had a group of brands and one of those brands was a, uh, was a, was a music company. I had done a cover version, of, no, no, I, we, we had created a Brad, Bradford Bulls song, anthem, and it was called Run With The Bulls. Um, and it was a bespoke song, it was written and specifically for the Bulls. And I did two verses of a rap on it. Okay. And this actually became part of the growth of the Bradford Bulls because we used that to target kids and young people. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Bulls grew to have such a, um, because it, again, like we were talking about off camera, the Bulls phenomenon wasn't a success on the field. It was what the experience was going off the field. Matt, you said it yourself. I, came, I was dragged along to the Bulls. I don't remember a game, yeah. but what did yeah. you remember? You remember the fanfare, you remember the atmosphere, you remember... I remember the songs, I can remember songs. Bully, 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 <laughs> Bully. I've got and, it. I've and and that's it where sports clubs in this country get it wrong. They focus all of their resources, all of their money, all of it gets invested into the outcomes of games. Yeah, yeah. results. And yeah. you, one winner yeah. in a whole competition. Yeah. There's one winner. Yeah. So that That's means a lot of people unhappy. That means what? Ninety-five percent <laughs> of the rest of that industry is going to setting up to fail. Of course. Build the model on something different. On what you expect. Especially if you bully, don't expect the, yeah, yeah. The, the other team to win. There's not people going to show up to the game now, are they? And that's why crowds are dying, especially in Super League. So what do you got to do? So you, you think of the competition that you've got now for the leisure spend, as we say. So you've got football that is an absolute powerhouse. Mm. They've got the marketing spend. They're getting billions of pounds to spend on the development of the sport, on the promotion of the sport, it's basically absolutely everywhere, which is the strength of the Premier League, right? But then you're going also up against things like cinemas. So cinemas now, the most of them you go into, if, if not every cinema seat you can go into, you're a lazy boy, you know, the feet come up, and you sit back, you're a big so seat. Good, and that's just a standard, you're in an air conditioned room, and you get an hour and a half, two hours worth of entertainment that basically the, the images are popping off and you're becoming a part of it. They're blowing things under your legs. You're, it's the interactivity and you've got food, you know, popcorn and everything that you need. A lot of the stadia now is just it's aging, it's old, you know. Does mum who's never taken young Matt to a stadium before and in this hyper-masculine sport that's volatile and violent and everyone knows their songs, but you don't. Mm. Do you want to take them there or do you want to take them to the cinema? Absolutely. You and be a part of that. And that's what people, what, 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 what sports clubs mm. owners need to start to reposition re their mind, mindset. Mm. Um, so it's a good point because I remember when you were playing and when I was there singing in the crowds, it was my nan was there, my mum, you know, it was very much a family atmosphere. I, think. Yeah. I feel like football yeah. has always been a, a male kind of dominated dads and, and sons go, but but rugby at that time especially just it just felt like the whole family went and that was it and then we we captured this golden little era where the growth and the profile of the sport was really high that was on the back of an argument between two uh, media moguls down under uh, rupert murdoch and kerry packer um, they started throwing some ridiculous money around and because sky kind of won out in the end um, they were able to promote it to a certain extent that rugby league got caught up in this really high profile thing the bradford bulls did the, the perfect um, game plan to that respect, and they based everything around their match day experience. There are some clubs, Leeds still do it very well, and that's why they've been able to grow mm. their um, their fan base year on year, even mm. with some terrible seasons that they've had. You know, yeah. twice they're still a very big club though. A million they? pound, you know, the the, the sorry, the, both twice have been in the um, gone into jeopardy, gone into playing against championship clubs. And the first time they did it, they, they still were the highest pro, um, supported club in, in, in rugby league. Why? Because they built their fan base on targeting families and children. They do things like um, bring a family for 20 quid 
and get a hot dog and a drink for 20 quid. Yeah. Brand new, you know? Mum's thinking, actually, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, we'll that's, try that's something different. That's cheaper than going to the, uh, to the movies. It is, Because yeah. me and Dad are going to cost, what, 12, 11, 12 pounds. And we're going to have to buy food. And Johnny and, and Sarah are also going to cost eight, seven, eight, nine quid. So you're already looking at like, um, you know, 40 quid just to, just mm. to go in the first place, plus food on top. You're looking at 60, 60 pounds, 70 pounds round trip, or 20 pounds. You can go, and, you know, and Johnny's going to go with all of his classmates. And they're all, for 20 quid, I might go and get some of that. Yeah. You go down there, you go with other parents, it's brand new, the atmosphere is really thick. Ah, that's how they do it. And that's where, that's how you build um, that, that, that model, that experience. You know, we walk through, they walk through the, the stands for the first time. People waving, are you new here? Come and speak to us. Hey, yeah. welcome. You know, open arms. Yeah. That's what you want in your first experience. Um, <laughs> that's, look, that, that, that's the sports industry. I've, you know... I've had the luxury of being involved in it for a long time. I still, to a certain extent, am involved with it, but not directly, sort of indirectly, um, from consultancy work that I do, or just sort of like um, boards that I play on, or ambassadorial work that I do. Mm. Um, so I get to I get to be a part of it on my terms. Yeah. But um, you know, what really one of the biggest problems I've seen in the sports industry are the owners. And it's, you know, they're guys that have grown up on the terraces themselves. And what do most fans on the terraces want? They want a winning team. That's what they want. That's their passion, mm. a winning team. So if that becomes your motivating factor, then again, you're basing your business model and outcome, once again, on outcomes yeah. again. Yeah. Bad model. Well, I love this because like, a big thing for Dan and I for doing this podcast for both ourselves and the listeners is, is to learn one of the things is to learn about business and obviously the way you're looking at that is very much about it not just as a job as a rugby player but no. you're looking at the business model cool. and you've obviously gone on now aside I'm, from rugby to I'm not making it up it's not it's, it's not something that I've designed or developed we're learning from the best Americans do it that way yeah, yeah. of course yeah. that's you know, something that you always had an eye on you know not only as a player but then to progress after your career had finished did, did that seem like an easy transition for you, yeah. moving from rugby to, to now this? And, or, and was or were it always struggles? on your mind as well? Were you, were you always looking at what's next? Is that Look, the way I'll be honest, it? I'll be honest. Um, I didn't, like a lot of players, you're going through your career and you're thinking, what am I going to do when I get to the back end of my career? Um, and you always hope something's going to come along. But then what, what, I, what happened was I saw a lot of my colleagues, peers, they, um, they actually fell on really hard times, a lot of um, yeah. mental well-being issues. Mm -hmm. You know, they, their identity is all t tied up with them being professional sports. And when we get them out of high school when they're 16 and we chuck them into the... So it, young, isn't it? it People it, it, don't respect like, well, how young you are. And the only thing you know is chasing the dream. Once yeah. you get to the dream of staying at the dream, yeah. then you, your dreams become a little bit different. Do I then chase after international honours? Again, part of their dream is to get year-on-year um, -year success, winning trophies. And when that becomes... Uh, but importantly, importantly, what a lot of people don't realise about professional sportsmen, and team sports especially, is, is the cold... Uh, you're told where to be, where, when to be there, with who to be there with, at what time, and what to wear, every day. So you think about nothing? You don't think about it. It's all the thinking is taken away from you, so you can just focus on one thing and one thing alone, creating muscle memory so you can go out there and win games. Creating muscle memory so you can go out there and win games. So you, you take the thinking away, there's not a great deal of creativity that comes with that other than instinctual players. Mm. So... You also know that you know, you're, you're put on a pedestal, you're admired, you become a lot better looking. You know, I know so many ugly rugby players, <laughs> they're, they're, their wives are way out of their league. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> way out of their league. Oh, yeah, that's wondering. marketing for you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but the, the, what I'm trying to say is all of, all of that is others you, makes you an other, makes you not a normal person, doesn't allow you to think like a normal person, then all of a sudden, your knee's blowing out, you're thrown back into the real world mm. and expected just to go ahead. Now, we have, um, they have uh, support mechanisms now and um, 
uh, player welfare managers to help players prepare for life after rugby. Mm. During my time, there wasn't. None of it. What I did see was a lot of my teammates, my peers, my, my, some of my best friends fall on really hard times. Mm. And all of them turned to me saying, you need to figure something out and you need to figure it out quickly. Mm. So when I left the Bradford Bulls, one of the first things I started doing was exploring that. I thought I had a couple, two or three years left in me. Um, and when I went to Huddersfield, the Giants, they, their major partner was the University of Huddersfield. I had been involved with a lot of the promotional end. So when you do a, a marketing campaign, it normally builds out the promotion, get it out there. So these players are going to be somewhere here and they're going to be doing this. But there's a lot of work. There's uh, sort of the legs underneath the duck going a million miles an hour underneath the swan going a million miles an hour before you get to that promotional end. Yeah. I was involved with the promotional end. Robbie, you've got to turn up here. This is what you're going to do there and this is what you're going to be talking about. You're going to be, you're going to be you know, just that promotional end. But then I got curious about this, the big part, the work that goes in to get into that event. And um, so I spent a lot of time with the marketing department up at the Bradford Bulls. Um, Debbie Robinson uh, was a big, big friend of mine, big, inf quite an influential. God bless her, Cotton Sox. She passed away four years ago. Um, but she, that was a big part of my growth as a, as a young adult, learning about that. And I became interested in it. And there was a lot of creativity in that. So, I, would, I think I would have loved to have gone on to be a professional artist, but I didn't have the time to dedicate to that. Mm, yeah. One thing I could do was learn the skills of marketing in and around the sports industry. So I became interested in that. And then when the University of Huddersfield came along, I started talking to their Vice Chancellor, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Curran. God, I don't get that name right. Brian Curran. Crian. Crian. Bob Crian. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got that. Bob, Bob so, um, um, we'll edit that. Yeah, it's we'll fine. It'll look like you said yeah, it first. Right. <laughs> Bob knows I've had a lot no, of knocks over head. Yeah, um, so Bob, um, Bob looked after me. Uh, Bob offered me a job actually, and the Huddersfield Giants offered me a job when I come to the back end of my career, my two years with them. And um, brilliant. Uh, they, I didn't. I was. I got. I got a. I got another contract offer. I was going to take the job. I came very close to taking the job, but I didn't um, because I didn't. My brother asked me a question, right? so I said to, I said to the Giants and to Bob, "Yeah, I'll take the job. Yeah, it's ready for me to be a grown up." And um, uh, I said, to, I said to them, "Oh, well." My brother rang me the day that I was really making the decision, nailing everything around, down, and my brother rang me. He said, "You know, when you retire, you retire forever." <laughs> Have you thought about that? And I said, "I don't." <laughs> You know, just uh, moving on, going on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of, that's it, me done in professional sports. Yeah. And I had just really, you know, the, the contract that I was offered was twice, if not more, three times the amount that I was getting offered to go into marketing. But it was one of those things. The contract will feed my family for the night, but the, the job will feed my family forever. Of course. So that was the balance I was trying to get. Mm. But I, I thought... I started exploring that, so I spent the morning exploring what Henry had asked me. I one, I wasn't ready to retire. Two, I thought I could be better prepared for when I do retire. So then what I did, I, I, I rang up Ken Davies and said, Ken, I want to thank you for the offer. I know that I said yes, but I actually think I'm not ready to retire yet. I've got a great contract offer on the table for me from Salford, and I'm going to take that pathway. I rang Bob and I said, um, uh, Bob, uh, I'm, uh, thank you for the offer. I'm not going to take that offer, but what I am interested in doing is actually this pathway in marketing that you guys offer. And uh, we worked out a deal between the university and myself um, to, to, to invest. And I still go back and I, I do a sort of like a, a lecture every year with the sports marketing department just on sponsorship or digital um, marketing, those different things that, I'm, that I have an area of authority um, and understanding of. Um, I only, I only did it a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, it was good. You know, students really, really keyed in, really confused about sponsorship. I like to break it down. I say, if a rugby player can get it, you guys can get it. Yeah. All academics. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I went back to university. So I spent the next four years. So I was still full-time as a professional rugby player when I was at Salford. I did my first university year 
and a degree in sports marketing and public relations. I did my first year over two years. And then I worked on the final year of my year with Salford, I worked on a, um, a part-time club. So I thought there's two clubs that I want to need to speak to. I spoke, uh, um, so I reached out to Halifax and Lee Centurions. And um, Lee Centurions had just hired Ian Millwood as their head coach. Um, it was Paul Rowley, the assistant, that actually spoke to me early on in the year and said, look, we're really interested in having someone with your experience come by, help develop our young players that we have. And I said, OK, let's talk. Um, and that allowed me to, so it was a good deal for a part-time player and allowed me to study during the day and play and do my training during the evening. So yeah. I was able to then go full-time at university and for those final two years. And as soon as I left university, um, I just touted myself around and um, Ken Davey and uh, Richard Thewlis at Huddersfield Giants snapped my hand off. Said, yep, come on, come, come be a business development manager. Brilliant. And that started my journey as a sports administrator. So two and a, one and a half years, two years there, and then I moved to Bradford. And Bradford, you know what? <sighs> Hardest three and a half, four years that I've ever done in my life because there was just so many curveballs thrown at you. With the but club's financial issues. And financial yeah. issues and well-documented financial issues. And you know what, though? The hottest fires make the hardest steel. Mm -hmm. And that's why my, my mindset was always like, you know, OK, now that's stressful. Let's find a solution. I'm a solutions man. I like to find a solution. And, and yeah, it took a lot of time, uh, put a lot of pressure on. But I'm used to pressure. I can deal with that. Um, I, you know, I learned coping mechanisms. And um, I still use all of those coping mechanisms to this day. I'll openly talk about um, uh, mental health and well-being. I'm an advocate for breaking down the stereotypes. I've done a lot of things. I've had anger management training personally. I've done uh, on and off counselling had pers for personal things for myself. You know, things not going right or oh, that doesn't sit well with me. This was all I had to do it all myself. It was me going out and actually sourcing a counsellor. We didn't have player welfare officers and mm. sporting chance in all of those areas that they have now. I was just smart enough to know something's not right with me, so find a solution. Yeah. My solution was That's, to go counselling. You're lucky old. that you had that mindset anyway. Other people wouldn't think like that. You're very solution driven by Yeah, society. I am. And you know what? I've, I've reached out to my peers. and I, 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 It's frustrating for me because it's easy for me. Mm. This is the way I look at it. We'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll hire a 60 to 120,000 um, pound trainer at the club, to, you know, a strength and conditioning trainer. Yeah. And, you know, that's the sort of Super League level, that's what they're getting paid, um, to come and sharpen ourselves physically. Mm. But it's all for nothing if you're not there. Yeah. yeah. You need to treat your mind like you treat your body. As an athlete, to be the best, you need to treat your mind like you treat your body. You're going to be throwing all these nutrition products into your body, training at the right time, making sure that you're getting enough sleep. More importantly than that, you've got to get your head right because none of it will happen. You won't be in the game if your head's not right. And that's the way I look at it. It's just another counsellors, uh, anger management specialist, hypnotherapy did that as well, tried that. Um, uh, meditation. Uh, uh, yoga, all of those mind-body integration. I think, I think it's that so important that people are hearing somebody like yourself talking openly about that and yeah. saying that's something you think is good because especially in sports, it's, it's sort of very much macho kind of um, persona. We don't do well, talking. And look, you can still be macho. What, why? What's macho about not being the best you can be? Absolutely. You know, that, that's the thing. It's like... Um, I love this quote. I can't remember who said it. Um, I ask for help, not because I'm weak, but because I want to remain strong. Brilliant. That is a, yeah. you know, that is a, yeah. that is a very productive way of looking at it, uh, looking for help. Yeah. Not because you're weak, because you're strong and you want to compete at your best. Ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. That's fantastic. Yeah, People can start thinking like that. I mean, we're hearing about it all the time. People that on the outside look to have everything, 
turning up dead, you know, uh, committing suicide. Right. Still the biggest killer of men under the age of 50. Something's got to change, wow. man. Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to change that. And there's nothing emasculating about being the best you can be. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. You know, this is the yeah. thing that frustrates me is that, um, and, I, and I know it's tied into cultural understanding and we've got to just start breaking down those stereotypes and this. Um, I, I meditate. Uh, you know, I, I've got, as we know, I've got my own business. It's so stressful. The opening years of running your own business are stressful. You're still trying to figure out how everything works. You're trying to figure out where your sweet spot is. Um, you, accept, you accept to deliver things that just doesn't make financial sense, but you're so desperate to get it going and it just overlays and overlays. You've got to figure out a way of being able to deal with all of that pressure. And, and you know, luckily through my, my desire to become the best athlete I could ever be and stay at the top of my game, I was able to use those skills and as we were briefly talking about it off camera, roll them into my afterlife. So my concept here with my business, yes, we've got an eight hour day, but one of those hours has to be in the gym. So everybody yeah, who works for everyone you. Everyone that works for me, you have to go to the gym. If you, don't want to, if you don't want to go to the gym, you don't work for me. It's as easy as that. A lot of positive byproducts with that. One of, the, it's one of your five uh, ways to, 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 um, ways to well-being um, is your physical activity. Helps you de-stress equally in that. And this is for business owners out there. You'll, you'll see a reduction in time off. Your staff will be healthier, fitter, and more effective. In the, in the office and that's that's a byproduct that I didn't think would happen I just the reason why I implemented that as a rule was because I needed it mm. so I like to you yeah. yeah and look the, the most successful team that I played in was the Bradford Bulls team that had that amazing legacy of winning two challenge cups four super leagues uh, three world clubs and what we had a really flat organization no one was above each other and we had some of the biggest profiles and egos and uh, personalities in the game, Danny, you, 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 yeah. you went out with us, you yeah. know there were big, big, big characters, but our, our organisation was flat, and that's, for me, what the type of business I've got to run, flat organisation, so if I need it, if I need to take an hour off during my working day to go in there and look after myself, then they need to, then we, we, we need to do it together. That's so good. Yeah, so many business uh, owners will just see that as an hour wasted and think that hour they could be working. But as you're saying, yeah. the results are showing. I look, yeah. I, look, I look at a lot of mental health and well-being statistics um, because we promote the offload program, which is a, a rugby league driven, rugby league cares driven uh, mental health and fitness program into um, businesses. Um, and with it, it's delivered by professional rugby players. You know, Guys that are hypermass, international rugby players, guys that played at the highest level, and they and we break down the stereotypes by them telling you about their weakest moments. That's how it starts off. Yeah. It starts off with a story, and the story breaks through the barriers when when they can see this hypermasculine man that played international rugby talking about things where he was about to commit suicide, literally at their store then there's nothing that anyone else in that room can't talk about. Nice. And um, he, uh, that, that is so effective. And that's why um, I look at a lot of those statistics. I'm looking at um, uh, productivity in the workplace and mental fitness and how that impacts on it. And that is one of the biggest stresses. We know um, our, our worlds have just become, we're on, we're on 24 seven. Social media is having the biggest impact on that. I'm a digital marketer. We, we need that social media interaction and those eyes glued on those mm -hmm. on those handsets of ours to 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 be effective in what we do. But I also know the um, dopamine release, the endorphin release that people are getting and are keeping them addicted to those mm -hmm. little screens. One thing that you know, one thing that the human culturally, uh, not culturally, uh, historically, from 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 our early man, caveman days. Yeah. We were taught that negative things were sticky. That's why the news is always negative, mm. because that's what keeps people going back. It becomes sticky in our mind. Why? Because caveman, me, sees red berries there. Those red berries look good. I go up, eat them. I'm sick. Oh, why? Why does it become sticky? Because next time I won't eat them. You remember. It hits you on an emotional level. You remember. Now. Those red berries, you only got to eat them once for them to make you sick to know you'll never touch those berries again. Mm. So mm. 
then they stop being as stressful, right? They stop being as sticky. So, but you remember, that's why it becomes sticky in our mind's eye. Well, our brains aren't used to the 24-7 negativity yeah. that we're getting at the moment. Yeah. And that's what's laying, layering the stress. And that's what's compounding this always on thing. So we need to find ways. I don't think people are going to put down their handsets anytime soon, but you need to find a way to release, relieve the pressure from that and actually come back to one. Come back to being present, not living um, with the stress of thinking about what you've got on your plate and having to do tomorrow, not living with the anxiety of what you've done in the past and actually just being able to live in the moment. Be present. That's what meditation does for you. Yeah. It allows you just to zone in, become present again, relax. And um, I've found that is a really, really great way of starting a new piece of work. So writing a campaign for a marketing um, for an organization's marketing campaign, pulling together um, designs, managing teams. If, I, if I'm going to start something new, doing a three minute, five minute meditation that just clears my mind, allows me to zone in and focus on. on well, we do it before a lot of these podcasts, don't we? We, yeah. we think every uh, time we train together in the gym, but if we've ever got a, an episode with a guest like yourself, we will always make sure that we're not training today in terms of physically. We'll do some stretching, meditation, that kind of thing, because it just brings so much clarity and focus. Uh, and look, if, if, if people out there are listening to this and you're starting to hear it, we're like, oh yes, real simple. Um, there's, there's free, uh, Budify is free uh, on, uh, on any of the um, app worlds, whatever you want to go on, or you can just go on YouTube, just put in five minute mindful meditation yeah. and listen. And they the the narrator takes you through the journey of how to do it. The more you do it, the easier it becomes, the more um, un unpressurized, uh, unlayered you become. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that your brain has to get used to. The synapses in your brain starts to welcome it a little bit stronger. At the moment, what, what's happening is you're, with, with every dopamine release, with every um, feel-good fact you get from, a, from looking at the little handsets, that bond is strengthening like an addiction. So the more drugs people take that in their brain, that becomes stronger and stronger, it becomes a need. And what we need to do is strengthen the other sides of our brain. Pick up a book. Maybe not this book. <laughs> but pick up a book and, nice and read a book. You know, a yeah. Books are, 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 are food for your brain. They, they allow you to, to, to strengthen your mind's eye and get, and get broader and stronger. And to and learn think. something. Yeah. One thing that we're advocates of is um, being very particular and being very careful of what you're consuming in terms of, you know, let, use the internet, but don't let the internet use you and don't let it drain you and be careful on what you're following, who you're following, what you're listening to, what you're watching, what are you piping up, having arguments with people, making yourself angry. It is totally unnecessary. I've and you've followed so many people. You know what? We're still friends, but I don't see their content. You just got to think of it like, um, like food, your relationship with food. You put crap food in your body, you're going to feel crap, you're going to look crap, Absolutely. and you're going to end up crap. <laughs> put good food in your body, you exercise a lot. What, is, it, what you're putting in your mind, what you're reading, what you're consuming, it, psychologically, it's exactly the same thing. You are what you eat. Your brain's eating stuff by what you're consuming. You are what you eat. If you're going to eat shit, you're going to feel shit. Yeah. Tell us, you, so you obviously said like meditation's a big thing, an hour a day everybody has to train who works for you, yourself included. Is there some other kind of non-negotiable rituals you can talk us through that you, you, you make sure you do every look, single I don't, day? Uh, yeah, not, for me there are, not for everyone. Yeah. Uh, but look, I, I'm one of those people who've been blessed with not needing to have a lot of sleep. I don't. Oh, I, I hate need you. Five or six <laughs> hours, and I'm good. Really? Um, and so good, good as well. Yeah. You're alert. Yeah. You're yeah, happy. Man, you're rested. I'm focused and, oh, oh no. Give me a bit of that, please. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And uh, so you're gonna hate what I'm gonna say now. So, <laughs> so look, I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old daughter. Um, uh, it's important that I spend good quality time with them, and this is biting into their time right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know it's me. We're talking. on it. <laughs> um, but uh, so so one of the things that I do start a new business got to put put the hours in uh, to get it moving. So one thing I was doing is coming home, working in that time with the in the family time. So I put that aside. So okay, yeah. well, I'm not going to work before the kids go to yeah. bed, and then 
I found once the kids are in bed, I was just pulling home the laptop straight away. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute, my wife's now who's had the kids all day or been at work and had the kids, um, is not getting any quality time with me. So I need to find a solution to that. So I say, oh, actually, I'm going to put aside one hour. It's going to be mine and your hour, even if we're just sitting there watching the TV, TV together, just holding hands. And then I realized that, you know what, because I still had to do the hours of work, um, we, we weren't going to bed at the same time. And I think that's important as well, you know, getting into your marital bed together, having that intimate alone time, quiet time, not in front of the TV and stuff like that, you know, the holy place, which is your bedroom, where you sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided that working at night was not, not, as, not very productive anyway, because I still wanted to be in contact with my wife, so what I, what I was doing, I was working with, there was a TV in the background, not productive. So I changed my model to, um, to going to bed with my wife at 10, 11 o'clock at night, but getting up at five o'clock and then working, and two hours of solid free time, kids are asleep, um, wife's asleep, Brilliant. no TV on. So five o'clock in the morning, I got two solid hours. Um, the kids wake up roughly about seven o'clock downstairs, breakfast. They've got the, it's just me and them time. Uh, you basically so, created a system where you're present with, with everything you're doing. Yeah. That, that it's all got its place within the day. It, it, that's my model. It doesn't, it doesn't work all the time. It yeah. doesn't, you know, I, I'm not on that all the time. Yeah. Like last night, uh, my son had a bad night's sleep. So I went into his room and he was awake for an hour because he had woken himself up. So it meant that um, actually by the time I got to sleep, it was one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Because when I went to bed, that's when he woke up. So he was up for about an hour and a half, just being unsettled. But that's so, life, isn't it? Things are going to change. You have yeah. to be able yeah, to, to roll with it. Yeah. So I yeah. woke up at 6.30 this morning. I didn't have that two yeah. hours. Yeah. But, you know, for the most part, I will get that time right. Um, so that's my model and that's my ritual. So I, uh, I do intermittent fasting, so I don't eat during the morning. So I have one less thing to do. Great. Um, by the time <laughs> we train in the middle, of, I train in the middle of the day. My body's hit that ketosis phase, so it's really chewing up everything that it needs to chew up, yeah. so I can um, achieve the results that I want to achieve in as short amount of time as possible. I won't work out longer than half an hour. Thirty minutes is the longest I'll work out. But then, what I'll do in those thirty minutes will be extreme. Yeah. Um, but then also, my, it's high intensity interval training that I only do, so my metabolism's spinning uh, quickly. Uh, my focus, because I'm not eating in the morning, I get no insulin dump. So my focus from when I wake up to um, till it's time to eat uh, after I finish training is man, I'm I'm zeroed in. So my productivity in the morning is absolutely brilliant. Mm. Yeah, um, that's brilliant. The one thing I could do better is prepping for the next day. I could prep for the next day better. So just put my plan together. I do it every now and again, but I should be doing it every day. So that's probably. Following this conversation is the next thing that's going to go into my planner. Brilliant. But that's, that's Come 4.30, thing. I've got to plan yeah. the next day. But that's the thing, isn't it? It's constantly reassessing your strengths and weaknesses. You've got to do self-audits, man. Yeah. You've got to, because technology is making life change. And what we were doing last year may not be the right fit yeah. for this year. Yeah. So I, I've got two green days a year, um, one in June and one in December, where that day is a self-audit day. So I'll go through, I'll clean out all my, um, all my, I'll clean out the office, I'll clean out the um, as many folders, um, digital folders as I can, just dump everything that I'm just not using and getting rid of emails and stuff like that. And it's that. in the diary as a day. Two green days love that you that. can't, that the untouchable. So you can't touch those, those two days, those are my self audit days. And then being reflective on, okay, how we're traveling, what can we use, look at your, ske uh, your programming schedule, that's brilliant, isn't it? I'm, I'm doing it. It just yeah. helps. It, yeah. just, it just helps. Yeah. It helps manage stress. It helps mm. manage life. Mm. And um, a great book, um, Rob Moore, um, Life Leverage. There's one for you. Life mm. Leverage. Life Rob Leverage. Yeah. It's how to fuse your passion and your profession. Nice. Love that. Which is what this place is. Jim mm. Downstairs, um, VIP. Uh, executive suite here, offices upstairs, everything in the one hub, motorway just there. Boom, on the motorway, see clients. It's the dream, you know, isn't it, it? And I live 10 minutes up the road. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Absolutely I, I love that. But you look, 
this hasn't happened overnight. No. There's no quick fixes. Well, that's the thing, and that's something I wanted to ask you about. A lot of people, I feel it's getting fashionable now to say entrepreneur, business person, all that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of people out there are just sticking that in their Instagram title. They're not really prepared to put in the work. You know, you know the problem there is all the bloody gurus that you see when you see they're everywhere. Your side, and they're nonsense. Yeah. They just talk so, shit. Hey, look, for anyone that's out there that's really listening, you really want to know how to get good in business, it's still the same old adage, it's 10,000 hours. You've got to invest the time. There's no quick fixes. Yes, there's the exception to the rule, but you want to roll the dice and be that exception to the rule? Yeah, take your chances. Then you'll probably just, what you'll end up doing is failing, 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 <laughs> and then you'll get it right. But what you, when you get it right, look back, you'll probably realize you've done 10,000 hours. Yeah. There you go. And that's the point. You, it can, by default. <laughs> you can yeah. do it another way where you actually don't do the failing. You focus on just working, working, and you, you, you accept that failure isn't failure. It's a lesson. And it'd be optimistic. The pint's got to be half full. And another thing is also there's no lucky people. Uh, look, they did, a, they did a piece of research at the University of Herefordshire, and they found they, they, they big piece of research, 200 people that thought they were lucky, 200 people that thought they were unlucky. And what they, the biggest trend that they found in the research was actually was their personality types. The lucky people were extroverted, outgoing, yeah. had big networks. The, negative, the unlucky people were introverted people, shy, um, didn't have big networks, weren't givers. The lucky people were givers. Give, that's a good way to, to grow your yeah. network. And because they had big networks, because they were likable people, because they were people that other people like to be around, more opportunities come their way. It wasn't luck, it was just their personality type. It, it's yeah. cliche, in it? But thoughts do become things. If you're thinking about, you know, being a person that's positive, yeah, that's man. putting yourself out there, you're going to be a lucky person. That's <laughs> it. At the beginning of the day, you're feeling down, talk yourself into it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I did it this morning. So. Sun didn't get to bed till 1 o'clock, 1.30 last night. I get up at 6.30, only five and a half hours sleep. And, I, and I'm just thinking, well, actually, it's knocked my schedule a yeah. little bit sideways. But I'm going to have a great day today. I'm going to have a great Brilliant. day today. Brilliant. And I said to my, my wife, just sort of dragging herself. My wife's a, um, a social worker, which is the hardest job in the world. And I said, you're going to have a great day today. Yeah. And she was just looked at me like, oh, you're mad. I said, no, you're going to have a fantastic day today. Yeah. Big smile on my face. And, and you, share the, you share the energy. Yeah. yeah. Too, too often in this world, we want to take, we want people to generate, yeah. you know, pay it forward. Gratitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. massive. Love and that. I've been that way my whole, my whole life. Um, I am a pints half full type of guy. Yeah, people have taken advantage of that. But hey. Yeah. You learn from that it too. It happens and... and they don't even take it once. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. only get that advantage once with yeah. me. Yeah. And, that, and for me, my dad, my dad always brought me up with this saying, say, um, if you make a mistake, it's not your fault. If you make it twice, it is your it fault. It is. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's and, so true. And, and so, so yeah. you learn. Yeah. I've got a... I've got a... I've got a so I, I consumed a lot of books. So the reason why I wrote this autobiography was I, th I thought I had a, a, a message to share. And um, one thing that I, when I was growing up as kids, I consumed uh, books from the best of the best. And you always had to read between the lines to find out how they did things. And you had to come up with assumptions and figure out, oh, that's, that's some right mindset to have. The book that I wrote at the end of every chapter, um, you can't buy these books anymore, so I'm not selling it. <laughs> I'm not selling it. You can't. They, you they, can they if don't you print hard. them anymore. I'm sure, I'm sure they might oh, be. like secondhand stores yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff well, like well, that. Well, we got it. We got it. Yeah, it might be online. Go on um, yeah. uh, eBay or something yeah. like that. Yeah, do check um, it out. I think I've signed every single copy as well. <laughs> I haven't signed that many copies. But <laughs> at the end of every chapter, there's a high performance. Now, I choose high performance because of HP and my, 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 my and surname initials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So high performance segments where actually I don't, you don't have to read between the lines. There it is. Yeah. Here's how to market yourself as a young athlete. Here's how to... Um, here's how to think of yourself as a brand. Here's how to commercialize what you're doing. Here's a training program. Here's a sprint training program. Here's a nutrition program. Mm. Here's a mindset and the way to have the right mindset. Here's a way to, I'm not sure if I do a de-stressing in there. I should have. Um, but in there also is have my, uh, so I, I, there's the power of four. The, the human brain remembers fours easier than any other, uh, four things easier than any other, any other number, which is why a lot of our pin numbers are four, four mm. numbers. Mm. Um, so. I broke down these particular traits of successful people down into four areas. Um, uh, one of the, the, the first of those traits is attitude. You've got to have the right attitude. You've got to be open-minded and be, you know, you just got to be positive. You've got to be able to be hungry, go out there and get it. You know, that be, think about in, in attitude, 
Um, the, the All Blacks have this great, uh, great uh, value that they stole from the Sydney Swans and said, no wankers. Be a good person. We want to work with good people. If you're good people, you'll attract good people and you'll attract a bigger network. And that's what people want. You know, I want to work with good people. So be a good person. Have the right attitude. Be positive. Be, you don't have to be extroverted to the extent that you're annoying, but be, you know, be welcoming. And yeah. I think that's really important. But be positive and be, want to be a go-getter. Go-getter. Yeah. The second, uh, uh, second trait is um, accept the responsibility of your station. You've got to say, this is me. You've got to accept that you're in I hate people that blame other people. There's just, it's, it, it just drives me crazy. Yep. If you don't accept the responsibility of your own station in life, you will fail. Mm. Well, Once you get you control learn, back, don't you, as well? And, and, and when you get the control back, you, will, you know it's on you. Yep. And when yeah. it's on you, you then do it. You're and in charge it, of It goes what back happens. to the, yeah. um, the attitude thing. The third one is uh, sacrifice. You've got to be willing to make sacrifice. 10,000 hours. Now, I sacrificed becoming a professional artist because I wanted to be a professional sportsman. And um, you've got, you got to invest that time. A lot of it comes to social time. You can't take away from your family. You shouldn't take away from your family. You can't, normally you can't take away from your profession. And if that's where you're trying to go, you've got to take away from that social time. You can't mm. party all night. No. Nope. To the early hours of the morning and think it's not going to impact. It takes 72 hours for alcohol to get out of your system. 72 hours, you're not going to be at your best. And the world's moving so quickly now, you need to be at your best. And this is how the best, this is how the best think. So I'm not making this up. It's not mine. I haven't created it. Yeah. I'm learning yeah. from the best. And yeah. that's how we all get better, by standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Love the view up there. And that's, what I, that, that's effectively what I'm doing. Um, so um, attitude... Uh, uh, responsibility, sacrifice, and the third one is evolve. You've got to love learning. The world moving so quickly, you just got to open yourself up to, to absorb as much information as possible. Now, I, the, the, so, so attitude, responsibility, sacrifice, and evolve. You've got to evolve. You've got to constantly evolve. The easiest way to remember that is make an acronym out of the first letter of each of those uh, words, and you'll come up with us. It's an easy <laughs> thing to remember. Yes. The attitude, responsibility, sacrifice, and evolve. Brilliant. Education, ass. evolve it, whatever you want. Can't be ass. ass. My <laughs> ass. So remember my ass, lads. You're not going to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we, we know you need to go. We want to just wrap up. We've got some quick fire questions, haven't we? Really quickly. Yeah. These, from, are, from these, the are from, these are from fellow listeners. So yeah. Martin Tordoff asks, what was it like scoring a hat-trick of tries, getting the man of the match in a Challenge Cup final, and then coming out on the losing side? Incredible. A bit of sweet. Uh, yeah. My greatest day and my most horrible day. A day that's so horrible that I still carry that bag of bricks around on my shoulders. And, I, and when I'm about 70, I'll probably put them down because I just won't be able to remember anything. But I'm dementia would have And, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and, I'm not, and look, I don't mean to say anything. Yeah, it's, like, an you know, it's, it's a horrible disease, is dementia. Yeah. yeah. Um, on, on a serious note. But, um, but also the greatest day. It's the day I made my career. On that one afternoon, you know, the first player to score a hat-trick at Wembley. The youngest captain to lead his side out at Wembley. Um, I got man of the match on the losing side. So I entered this weird little group of... The most successful losers, yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah, the way, yeah. way of looking at it. Um, so it. it was, it was bittersweet. But scoring that third try, the third try uh, I scored was absolutely incredible. Uh, and it wasn't because of scoring the third try. No, actually, they, they, the sponsors put up ten grand for it as well. So ten thousand yeah. pounds. Yeah. So a lot of people were making. Yeah. The players were making a lot of big. Not the front rows, but the wingers were. Yeah. yeah. And like the front rows do all the work and the wingers get all the glory. Yeah. Ten grand, no yeah. chance. Yeah, yeah. So I was me. It was, I said, a team meeting, let's say we give half to the team fund. And if you're lucky enough, you keep half. And the wingers were like, I don't know about that. But the front rows were like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's sod's law. Really. It's I fair. Score. That's, it's a lot of teamwork, though. And then the, exactly. The, the pack do a hell it is of a fair, lot of but yeah. sod's law, I won. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the hardest check I've ever that, really. that That third try were an absolute unbelievable try, though, I do have to say. Yeah, so I, I got through the line of defence. <clears throat> we were about 40 out. No, I think we were about 60 metres out from the tr No, I think we were about 80, 80 metres out. No, no, no. I think we were in about 50. We were about 50. We were about 50. We the ball up and out. No, about 50. Oh, the memory plays tricks on you. No, yeah, so I went through the line, and look, I come one-on-one with Steve Prescott, who was having an amazing game, and he was on two tries himself that game. 
And what was it? But for a, a lick of pain, which was a crossbar, he would have scored the third try. Because he hit the ball and came back into my hands in the first half, he would have scored a hat-trick. Yeah. He didn't, but anyway, uh, God bless uh, Steve Prescott's uh, cotton socks. Um, an incredible man. He's not with us anymore. He um, passed away sadly with stomach cancer uh, a few years ago. Um, but he outthought me. He outthought himself. He thought yeah. I was smarter than I was. So when I when I went to put some footwork on him, he thought I was going to come back on him. He turned himself, which fullbacks never do. They turn their back on on the defender. But he turned his back on me to give me the. To, the option of going back on him. So he turned his back and came back on me and didn't realise I had kicked on, <laughs> around him. But what made it incredible wasn't the try, wasn't the 10,000 pounds, it wasn't the, the scoring from my own end goal, sorry, 50 metres out. It was when I scored the try, I rolled. And when I rolled up, it was at the Bradford Bulls end, fans. Yeah. There's, mate, you Feeling. imagine nothing like yeah. 30,000 people just losing their minds. It's like a rock star moment. Yeah. You know, Queen and yeah. all of them that have been to Wembley. And this yeah. was in Wembley. Yeah, yeah. And they you had were that Freddie moment Mercury right when there, you're bro. at the front yeah. of the stage yeah. and you've just got an army, an ocean of people just loving, sending you love. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. But like I said, take that all back and for the winner's medal. Take it all back. I'll take a winner's medal. That's what it's about. And it took us a long time to get over that. And it took us to, that was 96, another five years. Three finals later, and we finally got over that hump in 2000 up in Murrayfield, and we were able to walk up that. You know, the RFL were cute on that one because they wanted, because me and Henry were in the team, they wanted the two brothers to go up and lift the trophy together. I said, bugger that, man. He's already lifted it with Wigan. Yeah. I've been working on this for years. <laughs> I said, nah, this is, I'm the captain. You can do one. So I went out there, kissed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're on your own, Henry. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love my brother, but I don't love him that much. <laughs> Um, so. Lee Crowther asks, what was your favourite 90s track? Lee Crowther's the DJ, you see, so he's, intri track. Yeah, he's intrigued oh, to, to take you back to the time when you were like playing, the, the around, of you that, know, like... Those years. Those years. What, what, what? Well, it had to be, here comes a hot stepper, because that was my that song you, when I scored tries when yeah, I came yeah. out. I didn't, I didn't even really like that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, yeah. it's still, but it has this weird reaction with yeah. me when I hear it. Yeah. And like a lot of people would like tag me in, they would like grab it from YouTube and they, hey, Hot Stepper, thinking of you, you know, yeah. on yeah, yeah. Twitter and that. That's what music yeah. does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It's, it's nostalgic and it connects to it. So, yeah. so tracks from the 90s, um, that probably resonates with me the most. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I've become a big fan of Wu-Tang Clan, Fuji's and uh, Method Man in, in particular, uh, Eminem also, you know, he, he, he smashed onto the scene in there. And I, I was a big fan of that. Again, more music I don't have to sing to, I can yeah, rap yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So, Naughty by Nature, I know that was oh, some of the yeah, likes man. as well. <laughs> <laughs> but that was 80s. Oh, that yeah, was that 80s, was, so yeah, if you had said yeah. 80s, I, yeah. man, I'd be able to pull loads out. Yeah. Probably Jump Around was, was my track. Yeah, yeah. You know, House of Pain's Jump Around, it was yeah. absolutely just still got me going. Yeah. You know, the song I, I love to hear at the beginning of every summer is um, Will Smith's Summertime. summertime. Yeah. Fresh Prince, Prince yeah, yeah. of Summertime. Just that for me, when, they, when, when radio stations play that, it cues summer. You're there, and it's yeah. like, yeah, it's summertime. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, nice. That's so cool. Jordan Turner asks, what was the most influential figure in your career, Not either Jordan coach. Turner, the player, one of my no, old no, teammates. No, 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 <laughs> um, either, either coach or player. You were a big Bradford, Bulls were a big fan, Bradford fan yeah. back in the day. Henry, Henry was the most influential player, one-off player, just a guy that brought the best out of me because, man, we were ruthless on each other. So many times people had to pull us apart in the changing rooms. Because brothers do, they fight, and no one, no one's allowed to get between brothers. That's yeah, yeah. You, you know, we'll both turn on you if you try and get between us because this has got yeah. nothing to do with anyone, yeah. but this is a family thing. Yeah. And when one of us won't playing to the best of our ability, we let the other one know. We, we our know. expectations were just so yeah. high. And that's probably why we were so successful together mm. as well, because we just brought the best out and we, we left no quarter. You know, it was just you, you had to perform every week. Um, coaching, uh, Brian Smith definitely he developed my game. He made me think of the game differently. He would send players like Graham Bradley onto the field to sweat me to make me do more on the field. He came up to me in one training session, you know you, you train harder than you play? So you, when you were training, you were at the front of everything and you play one million miles an hour, but when you play, you reserve your energy. I don't want you to do any of that anymore. You're the fittest guy in this team. You need to just go and empty it. And I didn't really know what he was saying, 
But when Graham, Graham Bradley, six foot six, hulking over me, swearing at me, ah, you yeah, lazy Kiwi, oh, no, get up there. And I'm then supporting, as I started supporting players and everything they were doing, my muscle memory became about taking the first few steps every time the ball went forward. Next minute, I'm scoring tries because I'm there every time someone makes a break and I had the speed to, to get there. The big change in my game taught me, you know, you don't have to pass the ball every time as a halfback and get smashed. <laughs> Here, this, you've got three front rowers. Tackle shields, it was nice to me. You got tackle shields, just run at them. Put three front rowers in 10, 10 meters. There was nowhere to run, just run at them. Had me do it for 20 minutes. Just getting bashed all over the place. And he was like, told them, smack them. And at the end of the 20 minutes, he goes, You're all right, aren't you? I said, Yeah, I'm a bit tired, but yeah, I'm all right. He goes, Don't have to pass the ball every time. Run, run. And that changed my game. Taking the line on, just taking the line on. Yeah. And I went through this growth spurt there. I had dense muscle, dynamic. I could move on the dime. And so if people didn't get a hold of me properly, I was pulling out of tackles because the tra weight training that we were doing was brand new to the game over here. So we had a real jump on that. Mm. So it was a real golden era. And that's probably why Brian had such a great impact on me. Yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, Katie Ellis asks, how do you manage to look so young? You never age, Robbie. Huh. I hang out with Katie more often. Well, he's, <laughs> he's already answered that because he it's intermittent yeah. fasting, positive thinking, yoga, meditation, take no people. Monday to, Monday to Friday, I eat really healthy. You know, really, my, my wife's a great cook and she makes, makes sure that we have a really balanced meal. We're, the, it's a ridiculous lunch that I have that most people, if they tried it, wouldn't like it, but we basically eat it. So we talk about regimented lifestyle. Um, I eat super grains, um, and seafood, fish every single day every day, Monday to Friday. It's the same meal with a um, protein shake on the, uh, to, to accompany it. Uh, nothing fat about it, all lean and uh, nutrition. First jam, in the, just in the, in the without, without the protein shake that's got frozen spinach and super berry, uh, berries with um, antioxidants and everything in it, plus the uh, uh, protein powder, creatine, uh, chia seeds, uh, almond, almond nuts. Um, all mixed in. Um, that in its own right is probably three of your five a day. This, the other superfood meal, it's got like five of your five a day. So, and just with lunch, yeah. I'm having eight of the five a day. Yeah. So, um, and it's all seafood. Those are all the, the meat that I'm eating. I'm not eating any red meat for lunch, it's just nothing but fish. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, we may, I may, if I'm out and about, I may pick up some chicken. Again, still white meat. I'm yeah. um, trying to cut my, my red meat. Hang on. I come from New Zealand. We, I love meat, red meat. To just sort of like, just in the weekends now, maybe one it's day. just discipline but though, isn't it? equally, Saturday and Sunday, I do what I want. I have a beer. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not, you know, I'm, mm. I'm not a priest. I have a beer. I'll eat um, takeaways on the weekend. My weekends, yeah. just for putting that's, my feet up. That's sure version there's an balance, element isn't it? of it is just, at least then my body's not knowing I'm not in starvation mode. Yeah. You know, it's sort yeah. of like make sure that the, it's telling my body the right things. Yeah. So it doesn't start storing fat and stuff like mm. that. But I look after myself, but it's all part and parcel of um, being in the right frame of mind to be as successful and as competitive as I can. I've, I don't compete on the field anymore. I now compete in different areas of my life, but I still want to compete. I still want to be the best. And I don't want to be the best in, against other people. I want to be the best version of me. I want to be the best version of me. Yes. And that's all I can be. It's the best version of me. And I don't get it right all the time. I'm not a saint. But I pick myself up, I dust myself off again, and then I go again. I don't beat myself up too much when I get it wrong. Love that. You know? yeah, I learned. Brilliant. Final one from Final the, one. the listeners. Andy Walker says, can Bradford Bulls be great again? They can, but it's going to take some investment. It, it depends what you mean by great, because the guys up at the club at the moment are doing great. Yeah. If you think about how the business is self-sustaining, and um, you know it's it's been able to pay for itself, yeah. But if you're measuring uh, greatness by winning Super League medals and getting into the Super League, then that's going to take some investment. That's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to show return on investment. That's going to need some altruistic investment from someone who's got a lot of money um, to get there quickly. Doing it the other way is going to take a lot longer in time. One of the biggest things holding it back is the stadium. I know it, I know the stadium. The stadium costs a lot of money to run. It's a big stadium. It doesn't create the greatest atmosphere anymore because you're going up against things that, you know, stadiums now on the Sparse, touchline. 
you got to you got to track this between and because it's so big and there's you know averaging two to four thousand people turning up to to game day in a stadium that big it's like rattling about in a can so that stops the experience being as good and wanting people wanting to come back more and more and more mm. so there's a lot of things running against it at the moment now unless for a short-term turnaround yeah any team can get good so but but the question to answer there are you talking about a good team or a good club yeah. The club, yeah. the guys that are running at the moment, are running a club in a sustainable way. They're not overspending. They're, um, they're smart with the negotiations that they do with every stakeholder. That means the council, rate payers, uh, people that have to pay rates to, um, governing body, because uh, the governing body owns the stadium and the rent that they pay. They've had to be smart on every element of it. And they're astute. Um, and things change though, you know, agreements come to the end and you've got to be astute again and, mm. and it's one of the dynamics that a lot of people don't understand about the sport. They see successful a successful club as being a club that wins silverware or is in the top four. It's not necessarily a successful business. Mm. It might be a successful team, but not a successful business. Yeah. They're two different things. So the question I'll throw back is, what do you what do you expect as a successful team? Yeah, what Bradford has got going for it? It's a major city. There's a lot of money in that city. There's a lot of commercial investment, um, and it's got a massive population. One of the biggest populations in the country. That alone, identity, um, integrating your your love, your desire for one's identity, will drive people along to support Bradford because it says Bradford. That's something that need, that that can't be overlooked. There's an argument to say that when the club originally got into um, into its first lot of financial issues, maybe the governing body should have taken a bigger, um, a bigger, played a bigger part in in supporting it, purely and simply to protect the marketplace of rugby league. It's great saying that in retrospect because you know the, the marketplace has been squeezed and so much more competition now, but. That's one, you know, well, to be honest, that marketplace is still there. It just needs to be re-engaged and maybe success on the field will help that. Maybe a different approach, maybe a smaller stadium. Filling in the hole. Yeah, definitely. Putting a 14,000 seater stadium that you can create atmosphere and you can create fun with and micro stadium and have different routes so other people can consume it. You know, using social media more, using m m more sort of external content like this going out. So people can consume it in different ways. Yeah, so that's yeah, the yeah. way of the world now. It's how we consume it and how you can still be a part of the conversation. Hope that answers. That does. Thank Robbie, you. I don't think we can thank you enough for your time. We really no appreciate problem. it. Just before Dan asks you the, the final question, um, if, if listeners want to find out more about you, keep up to date with you, you're on social media, aren't you? Where yep. are the best places you hang out and so, post content? So me personally, um, um, my Twitter feed is probably the one that I turn to the most, most often. Um, it's got my biggest following on there. So for things, content in and around sport and rugby league and mental health and well-being, probably um, my Twitter account, which is at rhunterpaul. Um, my business is Extra Mile Marketing. Um, you can just do Extra Mile Marketing without the E. So we go on the X, play on the X. So no E, Extra Mile Marketing. Uh, .co .uk. You can go on there or the, go to the bottom of the page. You'll see all the social media feeds are there. Probably LinkedIn as well. So. You know, we're an we're inbound digital marketing company, um, that type of stuff. If you're interested in that area, that's where we've got our area of expertise. Um, but we still do a lot of things in and around sports, so sport PR, uh, uh, commercial sponsorship, that type of thing. So that's how Definitely. I can be uh, touched. And, you know, and if there's any interest for anyone that's interested in may have a manufacturing firm or the, the, the offload program, all the information about the offload program can be found on extramilemarketing.co.uk. So without the e, extramilemarketing.co.uk. There's a page dedicated specifically to offload. Um, all the, it's got all the different areas in which it covers. There's an um, explanation of, if you click on those links, internal links going out to uh, other blogs um, to explain each of those areas and how um, rugby league cares and the offload program can assist your organisation with it. So, it's a rugby league cares, but because we use specific type of software on our on our um, website, uh, we're able to track and nurture um, uh, interested people more. So, if someone comes on, and looks at something, say, "Well, you want to hear a case study? We can reach out to you, give you a case study, um, and 
you know, to, you take it from there. So there's loads of information on there for, for people to consume. Um, and everything that we've talked about, dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress, uh, mindfulness, uh, coping and managing, uh, emotional intelligence, all of that is dealt with in the offload program. Brilliant. And I am training <coughs> to be one of the presenters on the program as well. Fantastic. Final question. Final question. Robbie Paul, what is your definition of success? So my definition of success is, I've said it already, is being the best version of yourself. Yeah. Um, applying the us strategy, understanding like, have you got the right attitude? Are you a, half, a points half person type of person? Are you the type of person that blames others or looks to shift the blame? If you are, change your mentality on that, accept it all. Even when it's not your fault, go, what could I have done? What could I have done to, you know, or learn from it, be that cause. Um, be willing to make sacrifice, you're gonna need to make sacrifice, and be open and have a love of learning. Learn, 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 never stop. You stop and stand still, life's gonna pass you by. World, you know, business is gonna pass you by. You're gonna be playing catch up. So be constantly thinking about what's the next new thing, what's the way that you can grow uh, personally, if it's professionally, um, equally as well. Have a love of learning in all those different areas. Um, and learn from the best, see what the best are doing. Figure out, stand on the shoulders of giants, you know. See what the view's like up there. They're sharing the information. Reach out to them, find it, figure it out, and uh, learn from the best. Find what, it's not the same for everyone. My philosophy works for me. Find the elements of the philosophy that makes you the best version of you. And I'm a big believer in that. Everything that I do won't be for you, uh, but it works for me. Take what you, what you need from my message, throw the other stuff away that you don't need, and then fill in the gaps with maybe other people's philosophies and methodologies. Brilliant. There you go. Thank you yeah. very much. Robbie Hunt and Paul, thank you so much. Tom, no fantastic. No yes. Sorry. Cheers, all right. Absolutely. I can't thank you enough. That was absolutely excellent. <coughs> no worries. Thank you so much for listening to today's Rich in Success episode. If this episode has impacted you, there's a few things we need you to do to help support the show right now. Please spread the word. Tell a friend that you think needs to hear our message and subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Play. And please give the show a five-star review. Don't forget to also like our social media pages and tag us on your Instagram stories. Your support means the world. Thanks again and let's keep growing together.